We begin in the name of God. Peace be upon you all. Welcome to another session of From Gambi's Desk. And today we begin the 124th episode. What is Sunnah? This topic is under discussion. Thank you, sir, for your time. After having completed the discussion on the background, we wanted to know about the fundamental question that what is Sunnah in your view? After its definition, the list of Sunnahs was under discussion. What is that picture? What is their measure? What are the acts which we can classify as Sunnah? Kamdi Sahab Fisunnah that comes under worship, societal laws, and eatables. You have described them in order. I want to connect the series of discussions from where we stop. After this, you said that in the category of customs and etiquettes, the Prophet of God has also established Sunnah. Which Sunnahs are they? Before I go on to present before you the topic of customs and etiquettes, one clarification is necessary. In the category of what are called social laws, you'll remember we had discussed marriage and divorce. This is the place where I have written the words marriage and divorce and those matters that are related to them. Why did I write them? They have been written because marriage has been described as a complete topic here. Under this, there are many things which have always been accepted in the status of religion. One very clear example of it are the Muharramat, that is, which are the relationships with whom marriage is forbidden. It is also obvious that this did not begin with Prophet Muhammad. Since the beginning of the world, God has established these prohibitions, and by respecting them, the relationship of marriage has always been established. Further, I have compiled a list of such prohibited relationships, and I have also elaborated on those verses from the Quran where these prohibitions have been stated. Here the intention was just to draw attention towards this, that the word Mutalakat, along with marriage and divorce, has been written for the clarification of this reality. So this should be remembered. Right. After this clarification, I am now presenting the topic of customs and traditions. I had said that these are the four categories in which we have been guided by the Sunnah, that is, worship, society, food, and drink, and now finally, customs and etiquettes. The first thing in this is to take the name of God and to eat and drink using the right hand. If you look at this practice in the case of Muslims too, so you will find that even in the villages, Muslim women will be seen advising their children about this. Any person who has any connection with the religion, he will want to follow the guidance which has been given by God or by the Prophet of God. Whenever we have to eat or take a sip of drink, we should take the name of God at every such instance. It is said, eat after reciting Bismillah, drink after reciting Bismillah. This is the common tradition in our society. On this, the whole knowledge tradition of the Muslims agrees. And you will find that the vast majority of the people who have any connection with the religion among the Muslims to be following these practices committedly. This is the thing which we call Ijma and Tawatur. On the occasion of the meeting, the Salaamu Alaikum and its response. This is not something that is foreign to people. This is the tradition among the Muslims as well as the Jews. And for this, even among the Arabs, this was the practice. You will not find anything like this that the Prophet, peace be upon him, is known to have initiated this practice on some occasion. Hmm. Whatever was continuing from before, he merely approved of it. And when Muslims would usually meet each other, they would greet each other. Assalamu alaikum. Later on also, the same thing was adopted in this way. If you were to study the Quran, you will see that it too will point out toward its history. That is, it will tell about the prophets, that when Allah Almighty interacted with them, sent angels to them. This was the greeting and salutation. In the same way, peace was wished upon. What is Assalamu Alaikum? It is basically a prayer for peace. And it is by praying for peace in this way that we begin any rendezvous with one another. This is the etiquette which was established by the prophets, peace be upon them. When people of various nations meet with each other, they say some words or the other to each other. Obviously, these can be words of salutation, words of benediction, or supplication, and different forms of expressing love may also be there. Among them, a big thing is when we openly pray for each other. So among us, that is, among people who are followers of prophets, this method of supplication is prevalent. When we meet each other, we say, Assalamu alaikum, and then we reply to it. 
Gandhi Saab, when the Jews say Shalom, is this the same Salam? It is the same thing. The difference is in the pronunciation. Otherwise, the same Asalaamu Alaikum is there among them, among the Arabs, among the communities of the Prophets, wherever the Sharia has been followed. There the same words have been adopted as symbols. When a sneeze occurs, Alhamdulillah, and in its response, Yarhamukallah. This is a type of aberration in human function that happens. On any such occasion, we say these kinds of words to express our gratitude to Allah. God has protected us from an interruption, a glitch in bodily function. A sense of trouble had taken place. The condition has arisen. In that situation, a person feels helpless. When it ends, it becomes a state of relief. On getting this relief, Allah's gratitude is expressed. This is the word of gratitude to Allah. Alhamdulillah. In its response, our addressee or a person standing nearby says a word of prayer. Yarhamukalaya. May Allah have mercy on you. May Allah grant you blessings. This thing was also quite common among the Arabs. In the Arabic language, a special term is used for it. The word Tashmit is used for it. The word obviously becomes a term at the time, or a special kind of expression gains prevalence when its complete concept or its tradition is present from before. This is the same thing you will find in the Christians. In them, in the same way, if sneezing occurs, they will say to you in response, Bless you. So this is the common way, which has been continued among the nations of the prophets. These three things are related to our general etiquette. That is, taking the name of Allah and eating with the right hand. On the occasion of meeting, and its response, on sneezing, Alhamdulillah, and in response, Yarhamukallah. To know and participate in these things, you do not need to read any book. We do not need hadith traditions also. These are common among the Muslims. The scholars of the Muslims would be teaching about it. The elders of the Muslims would be teaching and informing it, the community. The mothers would be doing it also. The fathers would be teaching it to their children. Except in cases where there is some real ignorance regarding religion, religious tradition or religious language. Otherwise, generally, you will find these things in the settlements of the Muslims, in the cultural traditions of the Muslims, in the same way. When we meet someone, we will greet him with, Assalamu alaikum. And if we possess a strong religious awareness within us, then as soon as someone sneezes, he will say, Alhamdulillah. And in response, we will say, Yarhamukallah. Practically, the people who are deficient in this may do it, however. Everyone knows it as a good tradition, and they keep advising it. There is no need for any argument for it. After this, we come to some of the things which are related to the purification of the body. I have stated this earlier as well, that after the worships, the things which possess the status of being religion among the Muslims, they have three major aspects. One is the purity of the body, second the purification of food and drink, and third is the purification of morals, which is the most important. And whatever has been given in the way of law in our tradition is mostly predicated upon the instructions regarding the purification of morals only. Here, some things which relate to the purity of the body have been issued in the form of sunnah. Among them, the first thing is keeping mustaches trimmed, cutting the hair below the navel, removing the hair in the underarms, trimming of the grown nails, circumcising of male children, cleaning the nose, rinsing the mouth and brushing the teeth, which are expressed by the terms madmada, istinshak, siwak, and then istinjia. All these things that I mentioned, if you ponder over them, none of these aforementioned points can be related to any specific changes that occur in civilization. The way a normal human being has been created by Allah, He has been created with all these things. And if something is taught about the purity of the body, or if some etiquettes of bodily purification are prescribed for it, then these things should be taught to Him on the first day. In the narration of the Arabs, we have seen about Shaykh Waliullah that he has stated all these things in the Hujjatullah al that these things were present among them. They used to take care of them and they used to consider them as their own special things. These have been stated by Shaykh Waliullah in Hujjatullah al whose extracts I have narrated to you earlier. Here I am presenting to you an extract from Mufassal fi Tawai Hilarab, Abdul Islam by Shaykh Waliullah in which he explains further about these very things, 
as to how these practices had been prevalent among the Arabs. He writes, An al-Arab kanit duna min siwahum min lumam. Tasna'u ashrat ashia'a, that is, as against the other nations of the world. The Arabs used to be particular about these ten things. Tasna'u ashrat ashia'a. They used to take care of ten things. Minha fi al-ra'si khumsa. Among them, there are five things which are related to the head. What are they? Wahiya lab madatu, walistin shak, using water to clean the nose, and gargling. Wasiwaku wal fark, combing to part hair with a comb, wakasul sherib, and trimming down the mustache. And then he says, wafil jesadi khumsa. Similarly, there were five things in the body. Hiya, al fitana, to circumcise. Wahalkulana, to cut the pubic hair. Unatul ibtain, to shave the hair of the armpits. Wataklimul adfar, cutting of the nails, walistinjak, washing after urinating. All the Arabs used to do these things. It is not necessary, as we see now, that there are many religious things about which there may be indifference in some circles, or people become careless with regard to them, or they remain heedless of them. So it must be the same with them. However, it is clear that these things were known to them. They were prevalent. They were aware that these are traditions of theirs, and if this tradition was established, then obviously it was established with the teachings of Prophet Ishmael. This was stated by Shaykh Waliullah al-Dahlwi under the title of Hisal al-Fitra. If you see in the narration too, then even there, it is mentioned that these are natural things which every person should adopt. What comes after this? Bathing after menses and childbirth? That is, when impurity occurs after these natural processes, then before one goes to pray, a bath should be had to attain the purification. Normally, we carry out ablution, however, in case of ceremonial uncleanness, bathing has been made compulsory upon us. Without it, the prayer cannot be done. The washing of the corpse, the dead body. When a person passes away, then we give them a proper bath. That is... We purify his body completely. After giving him a bath, we hand him over to the earth. And it is not that we throw the naked body away. Rather, we dress the body up properly, which is termed as a shroud, or kafan in Urdu. For this preparation, this is the general term. We apply some perfume. In the same way, we put on a shroud. Then the burial takes place, i.e., it is not that we burn him or throw him away or throw it before the birds. Rather, we bury the body in the ground. The last two things are Aidul Fitr and Aidul Adha. We have discussed them in detail earlier, and I have told you that they were initiated with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the background in which this happened has been discussed in detail in the previous episode, when we were discussing the history. Okay. These are the customs and matters. In these customs and matters, if you look at each and everything, it will become absolutely clear that these things require from their very nature that they should have begun with Prophet Adam, peace be upon him. That is, these are things of such kind, about which you will not be able to say that people would have learned these things with the changes of civilization. They should learn them on the first day itself, and if Allah has demanded them, then they should be taught on the first day itself. They should be prevalent in the nations of the prophets, peace be upon them. Since we have said that in the background of the prophet, peace be upon him, there is the religious tradition of prophet Abraham. Abraham, peace be upon him, settled his son Ishmael in this land. Ishmael was settled here in Mecca for the guardianship of the holy sanctuary. Allah's house came to be built in this land. Allah chose this land specially for himself. We travel to this land during Hajj, and Umrah. Hence, the tradition which was present here as the Abrahamic religious tradition. Among them too, people knew all these things. They were familiar with them, and they had adopted them in the status of religion itself. They were their religious symbols, and in this way, they were present in the background of the Muslims. The Prophet had been following them from the beginning. Later on too, he emphasized them and drew attention toward them. And if at any point the Quran has made any clarification about them, then their mention was made there too, for example. After menses and childbirth, 
The mention of bathing came in the Quran too. The Quran did not give any initial instruction there. It only emphasized upon a tradition which had already been there and has stated its limits. Similarly, Usrul Janaba has been mentioned in the Quran just as ablution has been. That is, if the idea is to clarify some particular topic or to state some leave or permissiveness regarding it or to correct a misunderstanding of the people. So the Quran makes it a subject and sometimes by stating the whole thing, it tells that this is the aspect of granting leave in it and that such and such a thing will be carried out in this manner. I have said that this is what has happened regarding fastin. The Prophet, peace be upon him, had initiated the worship of fastin. With the month of Ramadan, that is the entire month, the Quran itself has given a reference to it that people were aware of the fact that fasting is for a few fixed days, a Yemen, Madudet. And afterwards, it was stated about them that when you are in a situation where you are not able to observe the fast, that is, due to some illness or because of traveling, then you should complete them on some other days. These words are telling us that people are aware of the days for observing the fasts. So the Prophet had himself initiated it. However, the Qur'an has stated some leaves and permissions and drew attention to some things and corrected some mistakes. So it went in great detail. The fasts were also discussed. In exactly the same way, some of these etiquettes were also discussed in the Qur'an in the same way. That is, if there was a need to emphasize something or answer a question, then the Qur'an made it a topic. However, they were not initially stated in the Qur'an. Their beginnings had occurred in the form of sunnahs of the prophets, and it was with the approval and confirmation of the prophet that the Muslims accepted them. With this, we have come to the end of this category also. Prior to this, we have told you that what were the worships that the prophets of Allah had initiated. We have told you that concerning social laws, what things did they adopt as sunnah? We have told you about the things related to food and drink, which were already accepted as a part of the religion among the people. Now, if we include the customs and the etiquettes, then what are all of these? These are the rules of sunnah. This point that they are. The rules about sunnah is what I clarified towards the end. That is, whatever I have stated in the form of an enumerated list, I have stated in my research, that this is what is sunnah. Other than these, nothing else can be defined as a sunnah. Regarding all these things, there is consensus among the Muslims. No one has ever disagreed with them. The list that is mentioned there is being published in this book since the year 2007. No one has ever said that something should not have been included in it. Regarding every one of these things, it has been accepted that they are sunnats and that the Muslims should take care of them. These are prescribed by God's Prophet. Obviously, if the Prophets of Allah have prescribed them, then it has become a religion for me. Prior to this, this narration was of the Prophets only, and they too had been prescribing all these things for their respective communities. So the Sunnah is only this, and it can be said with certainty about it, that in terms of evidence, there is no difference between it and the Quran. That is, where do we get the Quran from? From consensus and continuity of practice of the Muslims. All the Muslims give this testimony about that book, that it is the book of Allah, which we have received from the Prophet, and we are transferring it generation after generation. The same way they give testimony about Sunnah, that is, their knowledge tradition expresses its consensus on it, and their multitudes, that is, a large number of people have accepted all these things as religion. This is Sunnah, and it is absolutely certain about it that in terms of authenticity, there is no difference between it and the Qur'an. The way the Qur'an has been received from the consensus and continuity of the Sahaba, in the same way, it too has been received through these means. That is, the Sahaba have, by consensus, transmitted all these things in the status of religion, and there was a contiguous practical adherence of it. All of them were acting on it. They could never conceive of this, that there would be someone who wouldn't practice it. Later, however, it can be said that there could be a mistake in practice. However, as far as the knowledge of the Muslims is concerned, they agree on it. There hasn't been the least scope of disagreement in it. So I have written that it has been received from their consensus and practical adherence, the whole sunnah. It is not dependent on any isolated reports. It has been received from their consensus and practical continuity.
And like the Quran in every era, it is proven by the consensus of the Muslims. Okay. That is in every era, the knowledge of the Muslims expresses their consensus. When I seek religious knowledge, I enter the school or a seminary, I learn from a teacher, I turn to my parents, the complete knowledge of the Muslims. Wherever they may be living, this tradition tells me, it is transmitted to me, it's being transmitted with consensus generationally. Hence, there is no scope for any debate or dispute regarding it. That is, just as there can be no conceivable scope about the Quran, to tell by debate what parts of it are genuine and what is not part of it. Similarly, there is no scope of any debate or dispute about the Sunnah. The question that arises after this is that people say about some things other than these that it is Sunnah. Yes. For example, a person might come and tell you that tying headgear is also among the Sunnah, or he will say that riding a horse is also Sunnah. Eating dates also is. Eating dates is also Sunnah. So regarding some things, people will be seen while narrating this sort of a thing. That is, apart from these, the list that we have come across, apart from these two, some other things would be declared as Sunnah. It is possible that some people of knowledge too will adopt the same interpretation. That is, about these things or apart from these, about some other thing, that this too is sunnet. In the same way, you must have seen that there are some examples of prayer about which it is said that it is sunnah. Two sunnahs of fajr. The two units of the fajr prayer, or we are performing two sunnahs of maghrib. So these terms are generally found. Yes. Obviously, this is a matter of disagreement. I have not included any of these things here. Why have I not done so? What is my argument in this disagreement? I have further ahead stated this under the title of Principles for Understanding the Sunnah in my book. Okay. Those principles have been stated in whose light this list has been enumerated. Principles of ascertaining Sunnah. The principles for determining the Sunnah. That, how will the Sunnah be determined? How will we justifiably say that eating dates is not a Sunnah, however, all these are Sunnah? This is a debate. Obviously, for this debate, a principle should be determined. Mm. This cannot be proven just by saying, what are those principles which have been kept in view when we were making this list? Or, such a list can be made. And if some other person wishes to make this judgment, then there should be a standard in front of him that he should know that these are the principles which I have to place before me to decide in case any person declares something to be part of Sunnah then whether I should accept it or reject it. What is the complete list of sunnah in your view? Gandhi Sahab has stated it one by one, in front of the people. And both the aspects came up, that the knowledge and the masses of the Muslims are not only familiar with it, rather, even in the time of the Prophet, they have received this as a continuing tradition. And after his renewal of it, the Prophet continued it further. Gandhi Sahab, please tell us one thing. You have enumerated this list and explained it. When you say about religion that the knowledge of the Muslims is also consistent with it, so if someone wishes to see, for example, does our knowledge tradition keep compiling such lists and generally, it is said that there are many differences of opinion, many different schools of jurisprudence. So does everyone seem to appear consistent in this matter? This point that these have been issued as sunnahs, they are prescribed, they have been issued by the Prophet of Allah, that they have to be adopted by the Muslims. There's never been any difference in it. I have said that if something is excluded from this list, that is not under discussion. Mm. Everyone accepts this much. Some things which I have not included in it, there is a debate about them, that they should also be included. Right. I have said that if I have not included them, or if I am disagreeing in this matter, then shouldn't there be a basis or a principle for this disagreement? Mm. We will discuss them further. And I will tell you that those are the seven principles which I have put forth in compiling this list. Now, if someone wishes to disagree with me, then either he will debate those principles that there is a mistake in them, mm. or that this principle should not be there, or he will discuss their application, that the principle is correct, but there is error in application. And we are all human beings. We are doing our research. If a mistake is found in it, then we should accept it quite humbly. We had started to learn Gandhi Sahab's view on a sunnah. We will discuss the seven principles of sunnah one by one. We are running out of time. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.